Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich Gurman. My guest today is a truly powerful and accomplished Renaissance woman. She's an ocean advocate, a science communicator, marine biologist, TV and podcast host, public speaker, lover of the arts and adventure, an avid stand-up paddler, which makes her okay in my book. Danny Washington, the Mocha Mermaid, welcome to the show. It's an honor. How are you? Oh my gosh, it's an honor, Rich. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in deep with you. So let's begin. So you and I both have roots back in South Florida, and I want to get into that. But first, let's start with the big picture. I have a, you know, just, I'd like to get more into your background and everything like that. But first, can you share your 30,000 foot perspective of the world that we find ourselves living in? And how did we get here? Whoa, that's a big question. 30,000 foot view. Um, I believe that we are in a transition, a transitional season where we're reassessing everything that we do as human beings on this planet and considering what life would be like elsewhere. But when it comes to my own personal perspective, I love planet Earth. And I think that this transition was very necessary because we were headed, you know, um, on, a, on a fast track to nowhere, really. And now it's time for us to rethink everything from our systems to how we interact with each other, how we handle our health. And of course, the, the importance of the health of the environment and our life support system. And so now it's like, it's a painful period. I think there are lots of great growing pains and different things that we all have to reckon with and understand and do things a little differently than what we were used to. And normal is not normal. Normal is a thing of the past. It's time for us to create new things. I agree. I feel like last year was like this perfect storm. Uh, we had a pandemic, which was this big wake up call. It caused us to slow down caused us to turn the engine of the world off and give it a rare moment to repair itself. Like you said, a pandemic, which also opened up some eyes, hopefully, to how important it is for us to take care of ourselves through better nutrition and a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Global economic crisis, which a uh, crisis which showed really our frailty and increased divisions financially, and of course, uh, a racial revolution. I'm curious, what was your personal experience of the last 12 months and if hindsight is really 2020, what lessons <laughs> did you personally learn through all this? Well, I would say my experience was definitely humbling and it, it kept me, um, obviously I was grounded here in one place. And previous to this, for the last five years, I've spent most of my time bouncing around to different locations, working on different productions, um, different speaking gigs and other projects, which is was wonderful. And I know that I'm for sure built for that type of lifestyle. Um, but at the same time, once I finally stopped and was able to sit still uh, during lockdown, it was like a freight train crashing mm -hmm. and coming to a screeching halt because I just realized how much energy I had been putting into just the movements I was making in the world, the projects that I wanted to support. And it was pulling everything out of me. And I, I realized that I did not have enough left for me and my, my tank wasn't full. And so that was the first wake up call. And then secondly, I think it felt inevitable. I think I, I, I almost knew intuitively that within my lifetime, we would see something like this happen just because of the rate of consumption, the way that we, again, move around the world, the way that things were just, it just felt like it was headed in that direction. So in a way, I felt a bit relieved that that moment was had arrived. It's scary mm -hmm. as it was and as scary as it is right now, there's so many un things that we're uncertain about and that we don't know what the future holds. I mean, that it makes me nervous, but it also makes me excited. So for me, this entire year has been completely transformative. It's helped me reevaluate everything that I'm doing in my life and why I'm doing it and giving me a clearer sense of purpose. Wow. That, there's a lot in there to uh, unpack. So you, it was just go, go, go. And then all of a sudden just this dramatic stop, how moving forward now that, you know, we can get back out into the world a little bit. How do you, how do you plan to find and maintain some balance through it all? Well, of course, getting back in the ocean as much as possible is one of those one of those tactics that helps me stay grounded. But also meditating, connecting more often with my family and my loved ones and being willing to stop and being willing to rest. 
uh, because I wasn't doing that before as much as I should have been doing at that time. And now I feel like that's the only way I'm going to be able to maintain the energy to keep pushing forward, not only as someone who's, you know, working to be a leader in this space, but also as a friend, as a, a mentee to my mentors and vice versa, like that that sacred energy that's within us has to be maintained. And you have to figure out what, what are the mechanisms that will help you maintain that energy within yourself? Because it's different for everybody. Totally. It sounds like you're saying like, this is a marathon, right? We're not running a hundred yard dash. When we look at our own lives and what needs to be done in the world to help create a sustainable future for, for the planet, right? It's, it's not going to happen overnight. So you, you need that energy for the long haul, right? Yeah. And I laughed at myself too quite a few times during lockdown because I remember distinctly being in places and doing things that I was like, gosh, I wish the world would just stop for a second, you know, like just give me a chance. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there you go. The universe never fails, right? <laughs> it gives you what you ask for. <laughs> Careful what you wish for, Danny. <laughs> now oh we know who to blame. <laughs> oh, it's all my fault. All my fault. <laughs> I don't know. We kind of just took responsibility there. No, I hear you though. <laughs> You, you mentioned a minute ago this the the power of getting in the water, um, which obviously for me is a huge deal also. And, and you and I obviously share this common love for the ocean, for the marine animals. Um, it seems like, like an oxymoron, but I always say that I feel more grounded on the water than I do on land. Uh, I'm curious, how did the ocean cast its spell upon you? And <laughs> how does water shape us as people? Oh, in so many different ways, but it, the ocean, um, my love for the ocean began at a very early age. My parents took me to the beach a lot in Miami when I was growing up, um, from when I was an infant all the way through my teen years till today, you know, that is one of the things that we do, um, whether it's just me and my mom or with us and friends and it's just a gathering place that feels so good. And just listening to the waves and feeling the sunshine, is an experience that really um, kind of just melts my life like experiences together in a way that I, I can't really explain. It's it's one of those things where I could be moving around the world and, and traveling and doing all these different things. But the moment that I step on that sand and I feel the waves touch my toes, everything falls away. Any thoughts that I'm thinking about, anything that's stressing me out, it's all gone in an instant. And that the power that the ocean has, that specific power is is like nothing else. And so that's the main reason why I continue to, to run back to it. And of course, you know, having a little bit of, of background in science and knowing the cycles and the systems that keep this planet going the way that it does, we know that the ocean is that lead generator. It's the place where we get our oxygen. It's where we get food. It's where, you know, climate is being regulated. And, um, my life's mission is literally to just help forge new connections between human beings and the ocean. And that's, that's really the essence of my work. Amen to that. One of the <laughs> first interviews I did on this podcast was with Wallace J. Nichols, author of Blue Mind, who really, yes. like you, looks at it's, it's this great blend of the I'd say the spiritual reasons why why we feel like we feel like you said as soon as your toes hit the sand like everything just washes away and also the scientific reasons behind that you you had an interesting upbringing though i mean when you were six years old i believe you said you wanted to either be a pirate or a mermaid my <laughs> my important question is which one did you choose or did you just decide to be both of them and <laughs> and also what led to your mom or to you telling your mom that you wanted to be a marine biologist. That's that's pretty early in life to have any vision for oneself. Uh, and yet, you know, a marine biologist, that's pretty atypical, yet very powerful. Mm, that's a good question. So, yeah, it was one of those things where I, I wasn't like most kids who kind of switched ideas every week on what they wanted to be when they grew up. Um, I don't know why that is, to be honest, but I don't think there it, either way. There's nothing wrong with either way. You could switch every week or you could stick with one thing. But for some reason, I was enamored by the ocean and I knew that I, I just wanted to explore it 
And so once my dad actually told me, hey, you can study all life in the ocean through marine biology, that's when it clicked for me at six. And then at that time, you know, not having the internet like we do today, it wasn't like I went and Googled what it meant. I had to read books. I went to the library. Uh, my parents helped find books for me as well. And that's where I discovered Jacques Cousteau and, um, and those stories. And then by 17, I met Dr. Sylvia Earle in person mm. at a sleepaway event, like a kind of like a a camp experience at a local museum in Fort Lauderdale. And I went there with my friends. This was in high school. And we had a chance to listen to doc Dr. Earl um, speak to a massive group of like 300 students. And then I got to talk to her afterward, had a little conversation and just, I loved her presence. And I loved the way that she explained her experiences in the ocean without making it sound too too complicated, too sciencey, but it was, it felt more like a, a human co connection. And so she's been a major role model in my life. And so has Dr. Wallace J. Nichols. I mean, when I met him in my mid twenties, his book changed my perspective completely, even though I kind of felt like I innately, I knew what he explained. It was great to see it on paper and to see mm -hmm. that there was scientific research behind it. Yeah. When you mentioned Sylvia's name, <clears throat> you gave me chills. I just, I, I have very few heroes in life. Um, but I, my heroes, I always say my gurus are the dolphins and the whales. Uh, as far as human, Sylvia is, is definitely on that short list. And to me, she just, she just represents the empathy that we need right now more than, more than ever. Um, you, so you met her in Fort Lauderdale? That's so yeah. speaking, speaking of Fort Lauderdale, I lived in Fort Lauderdale most of my life. No way. Before, yeah. <laughs> I, went, I went to high school there. So I, I was there my whole life before coming here to Laguna Beach in 2006. And I believe in 2008, right, you graduated from the University of Miami with a degree in marine and atmospheric science, and you decided to be a science communicator. Uh, that same year, you made about 200 videos for K through 12 students. How do you define science communicator, and what was the niche you saw a need for that you wanted to fill with those videos? Mm. Well, I went to South Broward High. They had a marine science program there, a specialty magnet program. And that's where I had a lot of great exposure to marine science before college even began. And that truly catapulted me and, and encouraged me to, to move forward with getting my bachelor's. And so um, once I got to UM, I really enjoyed my studies. It, it was difficult. You know, I'm not one of those students who just easily got straight A's. I had to work for it. And it was, it was the same situation in college, but I also met a ton of mentors at the graduate school, which is a part of University of Miami. It's called Rasmus, Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And there, that's where I discovered that, um, the, the lack of communication between academia and everyone else, um, was really prevalent. And it, it made me feel a bit confused because I was like, well, why, why, why don't my local community members understand what's happening in Biscayne Bay and that, you know, we're dealing with chemical runoff or the degradation of the mangroves, like my neighbors, my family members had no clue. So that's, that's what really inspired me to want to pursue a career in communication. And then by the time I graduated, I serendipitously had an opportunity to join this team called Untamed Science to make videos for textbooks, K through 12 textbooks, uh, not specifically about marine science, but about science in general. Um, we covered yeah. everything from biology to chemistry to physics. And when I learned how to tell stories about science in a way that's engaging and fun, that was a turning point for me because I recognized, wow, this is a really unique position to be in, to be able to have that foundational science knowledge and then be able to use that as a tool to translate complex concepts and then make it digestible for anybody. Because if you can explain a concept to a six-year-old, like you literally can explain anything to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you speak the same language, of course. But yeah, that's that's really where the, the launching point was. And the rest is history. Over the last 12 years, I've worked on several different productions and other projects that specifically uh, focus on how to communicate scientific concepts to the public. So beautiful. I, I think most people live their whole lives without really discovering what we'd call their soul's calling. So to mm -hmm. figure that out, you know, we could say it started when you were six and definitely for sure by the time you got to college. That, do, you, do you look at that as a, a burden, a responsibility, a gift, a little bit of both depending on the moment or... <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both, but more, more so a gift and a blessing because to have that level of clarity is really, um, 
it's really helpful because it, it just, you can make decisions quicker about your life yeah. choices. But at the same time that my, like, I don't know if it's just stubbornness in me or just wanting to, you know, I'm not giving, just like not give up attitude. Um, it's, it's required a lot of sacrifices as well. Uh, there, majority of the last 12 years, uh, were a completely a struggle, a struggle to feel, um, like I was on the right path that because the world wasn't quite validating the things that I was doing, um, more often than not people I would speak to and would share, you know, what I was working on. They'd be like, you're doing what? And like, yeah. you're obviously not making money doing that. And <laughs> da, 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 which was true. It was true for most of that time because I had to work every odd job and different creative outlets and different opportunities that came my way just to like, put food on the table and keep a roof over my head and having friends and family who were willing to support my dream and my vision um, made all the difference. I didn't do this alone. It wasn't me just focused on one, one outcome. It was like, it was a whole village of people that helped make this happen. That is a great story. And, and do you feel like people are starting to get it? I mean, I, I would imagine intuitively you realize like, this is an all hands on deck moment and we no longer have the luxury of time. If we don't start making some significant changes as a species, as yes. a species, not only is the planet in trouble, but we're in trouble also. I mean, have you seen an evolution in the last, what, 12, 13 years since you graduated from college in terms of people's awareness and consciousness around all these issues? Definitely. I definitely see a change in consciousness. Um, is it happening fast enough? I don't think so. But what keeps me going is working with youth, working with people who are under the age of 18, who haven't quite been, um, <laughs> you know, uh, beat up by the ways of the world, which is, mm. is a fact, you know, adulting is a real thing. But when I talk to young people and their, their energy for life, their vision, their big ideas, not hindered by anything or anyone, that's what gives me um, excitement and gives me the fuel that I need to keep going. And on keep top of that, yeah, on top of that, it's like, you know, my identity is as a person, as a human being, uh, is, is multifaceted. And there are so many dimensions of me. And just like there are many dimensions of you, we have so many different things that define our lives. And one of the things beyond just being a science communicator, it's about being a face and a voice that's representing a group of people that have been disproportionately or traditional and traditionally left out of this type of conversation, which would include the BIPOC community, black, indigenous people of color. Um, specifically when you're talking about ocean conservation, this has been a predominantly white, you know, realm. And, the only way that we're going to evolve, the only way that we're going to push this um, this mission and this movement forward is to make sure that everyone's included, that everyone has a voice, that everyone can bring their experiences and their identities to the table and show how we can create solutions um, in a much faster, more efficient way if we have those dynamic uh, folks at the, you know, at the table. So... That's really what I do, what I, why I do what I do. It's not just about being on TV. It's not just about, you know, creating content. It's about representing something bigger than myself. That's a, that's a wonderful thought. And I, and I obviously want to dive deep into that aspect of, of who you are and why you do what you do. And, and maybe my next question will kind of lead us right there. Like most 21 year olds, you started a nonprofit. <laughs> yes. Everybody does that. Um, you, did, you, you mentioned having so much friend and family support. I know your mom was a big supporter when you started that nonprofit called Big Blue and You, uh, which as you mentioned, you talked about youth was dedicated to uh, inspiring and educating youth around marine conservation through arts and media. I think you call it ocean conservation through artistic inspiration. Yes. So how cool that your mom supported you in this passion of yours. How did this come about and what is the nonprofit focused on now? And then I think we'll guide that into a deeper dive into all things diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we started Big Blue and You because I thought at the time that was the best avenue to create not just a business, but a business that serves and serves my community. So at the time, nonprofit you know, nonprofit business structure made the most sense. I wish B Corp were a lot bigger at that time, but they weren't. Yeah. And I wasn't aware. Otherwise, if I could go back, I would have made it a B Corp. But um, yeah, it worked out because I received a, a small like amount of seed funding from Roxy, the surf brand, yeah. after I entered a competition 
talking about my passion for the ocean. And I ended up bringing my little cousins out to the beach and a friend of mine who happened to have a camera came with me and she volunteered her time. And we made this video talking about plastic pollution and how it was impacting wildlife. So that video ended up winning the competition and they gave me $10,000. Just like, do whatever you want with it. Here it is, create. And that's what uh, created Big Blue and You. And so when we started, we were focused on um, first like using storytelling and filmmaking to help um, uplift young filmmakers and young young people who wanted to talk about water, the environment, the ocean, and give them a platform to create PSAs that were about protecting the planet. And then from there, we started creating an event in Miami annually called Art by the Sea, which brought together artists from our community, as well as local marine scientists and undergrad students and graduate students from UM um, and other uh, institutions to teach kids who came to our event about o- the ocean using their craft. So imagine a day where you go out to the beach and then you have this set where there are like 20 or 30 different tents or booths and each booth has an activity where a young person can go and walk up and just get started and either look at plants and under a microscope or create a, a watercolor banner, a peace flag for the ocean. And that's what they, we did all day. Plus drumming, dancing, uh, paddleboarding, kayaking. And for most of the young people that came to our event, this was their first time actually experiencing the ocean in a positive way. They may have seen the ocean, dro- drove by it, you know, maybe hung out at the beach, but they really didn't go in the ocean or they didn't get to touch the ocean and see what was beneath the waves. And that's what we created through Art by the Sea. And so it's been a labor of love. Absolutely um, adore what we're doing in the world because we want to make sure that especially our young people of color who have not been included in this um, type of work, we want to make sure that this is a safe space, that this is a fun place to learn and to be introduced to um, you know, the wonders of the ocean. Mm. Wow, that is so cool. I, and I imagine you're 21 doing this. This is so <laughs> great. It, it, it's, it's always Thank blown you. me away how... Yeah, you're welcome. How... You're in LA now. I'm in Laguna Beach, like an, an hour, hour to three hours south of you, depending on the time of day, right? With traffic, <laughs> um, and there's there's kids that live 15 minutes inland here in Orange County, California, the one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest counties in the whole country, that have never even been to the beach, let alone, yeah. like you said, been in the ocean and really understand the power of it. So. I admire and love the work that you've been doing. And uh, by the way, just yeah, yesterday I had a conversation with Roxy's sister. Christy is a neighbor of mine. We, we just had a conversation yesterday. So a small world. So diversity, just like biodiversity is critical in the ocean and in nature. As mm-hmm. you said, we need more. We need more of it in the world of ocean conservation. Um, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson is making big waves with her work. I think she was on the cover of Time Magazine recently. I just saw her, was it two nights ago now, in Greta's uh, new TV series. Uh, she was featured. Who else is out there innovating? And more importantly, how can we be more inclusive overall? Yeah, well, Dr. Johnson's work is prolific. She is so brilliant, especially with her words and the way that she writes. Um, she's created quite a bit of um, exposure for this conversation around diversity in the ocean. Um, But there are also some other groups that I really admire, including Black and Marine Science, which Black and Marine Science is a a community of people who have been working in in all levels of academia, but also in, you know, in outreach as well all over the world. And then there's another group called BWEAMS or Black Women in, I always get this confused, it's (laughs) evolutionary. Hold on a second. Let me double check because you know what? I don't, I don't, I got to get it right. Got to get it right. Okay. It's the order. So Weems is another great group that I'd love to reference. It's Black Women in Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Science. And there, we've also formed another community of, of women specifically who have been working in, this, in these spaces. And I can't even tell you how powerful it is to come together with, with individuals who have had a similar experience as you when the entire time up until the point where we got together, we all thought we were alone and that we were siloed. And it was, there was just no mechanism to help Mm -hmm. us connect or that it just wasn't, it hadn't been created yet. But thanks to BLM and everything that happened during the summer of 2020, um, it really pushed us to create this space. And it was from one one tweet from Dr. Uh, Nikki Trailer Knowles from UM, from my alma mater, that created this group. And she, it was a, it was a call. 
for all of us to get together. And she's really done a tremendous job of, of creating a beautiful community. Mm, I love that. So speaking of University of Miami, on April 20th, uh, Julio Frank, the current president of the University of Miami, sent an open letter to the students and administration right after the verdict on the George Floyd case. And um, he, he talked about the need for change and a more production dialogue for social justice. Um, did you have anything to do with this, by the way? Did you, did you know about his statement? Did you have anything to do with that? No, I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, but I am happy that he made a statement. And I will just create one edit. I think I think a lot of folks spoke about it being the George Floyd case, but it was really yes. the Derek Chauvin uh, yes, trial. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, the ripple effect that um, Mr. Floyd has, has created because of what happened to him uh, is... You know, it's sad to say that, you know, I think, yes, the, the verdict was important, but is it really true justice? I, I, I wouldn't say so, because if it was, George would still be here with us. Right. And um, but it's a start. It's somewhere to point to as a North Star. I think our country, a lot of folks in our country and around the world are fed up with this continual um, unwarranted and unnecessary police violence against black people. Um, and it's time for change. I'm really, I think for us to just be able to exist as a people is, is, seems to be difficult and, and it is difficult. And it, it, there are so many different experiences that black Americans have across the country. And for the world to finally open their eyes and see that this is, this is not, this is not the way it should be. And we need something else because we're all human beings at the end of the day. And we all deserve an opportunity to live our lives and to thrive, not to survive. It's kind of like you said at the beginning that as painful as so many of the things have been over the past 12 months, they were, they were necessary. Right. And it's like, no good, huge thing is going to happen easily. So um, hopefully that pain is going to is going to pay off for us in, in the long haul as, as a species. Do you agree? Well, I think so. I think um, by by acknowledging the pain and then taking action to fix the source of that pain, that's really what's going to create the change. And we need um, our white brothers and sisters, our Latinx brothers and sisters, Asian, every community. We need everyone coming together to make sure that um, we can we can all be safe because no one is safe until that happens. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do. And we need people who are willing to be more than just an ally. We're willing we need people who are willing to advance others and to put forward the energy to uplift those around them who might need a hand up. I'm not talking about a handout. I'm talking about a hand up and an open door. While you're still yourself pursuing your own goals and dreams, you can still share that wealth. You can share that opportunity um, and you can you can create change that way. Uh, and it, we all have different roles to play. I think the the fear or the... The mistake is to try and take this all on yourself, on your shoulders, because nobody can handle that weight. It's all about what skills can you contribute to the movement? What can you do in your own individual life? Who are your neighbors? Who are the people around you that you can impact in a positive way? It start there. Like we, that's, if we're thinking globally, but acting locally, that's really what's going to create um, the, the, the evolution that we need. So I have a question on that last week online. I saw people criticizing ocean protection organizations like Surfrider for posting about the verdict. And they're basically mm. just telling them, you know, to stay, to stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Mm. Mm. And their answer was essentially that one of their lanes is supporting a culture where everyone, regardless of color, feels comfortable on the beach, in the ocean, in a surf lineup. So uh, what would be your response to that? My response would simply be, we're not going to take care of the ocean unless we take care of each other first, period. And until we reckon with and rectify the the issues that we have here on land between each other, there's no hope really for the planet and actually making sure that we protect nature because we're the closest connection you know, uh, between human, human being to human being. And we've got to really resolve these things first to move forward. And when it comes to being at the beach and... And having access to places like this, there's it's 
it's already proven that historically people of color have been um, denied access to these places that are meant to be a place of healing, to be a place of um, uh, just regeneration and be able to to just recreate and have fun like that as simple as that and i you know going back to big blue and you we we host our annual event art by the sea at a historic park in miami called historic virginia key beach park and this park was originally the only beach for people of color during the 1940s to the 1960s because segregation was still in effect so black people were not allowed on miami beach um, this was not a part of it. In fact, celebrities that would go to perform on Miami Beach were forced to go to Overtown on the mainland to stay there because they weren't allowed to stay at those hotels. And that is it's it, it's closer than what we imagine. We think that that time was ages ago, but it was really it was only two generations ago. And we're still dealing with the impacts of that. And then on top of not only the access option or the access issue, we're also looking at this disparity between people who know how to swim. And so the CDC did a study back in 2014, and I'm hoping that they're going to do another one pretty soon. But it shows that, you know, um, there are some real big issues with how many drowning victims have been uh, majority black. So, you know, when you look at I had this resource pulled up because I wanted to make sure to reference it. But essentially, children uh, between the ages of one to four are like some of the highest at risk at, of drowning, but we're still seeing that African American children between five and 19 drown in swimming pools at rates 5.5 times higher than those of white children. Wow. And that's because of the lack of skills in swimming. And again, that points back to our history as a country where black people were not allowed to even go to swimming pools to learn how to swim. So that that's been passed down and that has to change. And we really want to contribute uh, and help, you know, organizations like Diversity in Aquatics or National Association of Black Scuba Divers to create these opportunities for young young people to have access to these skill sets, which are just essential. My dream in life is to see the entire world, every child on this planet have uh, the skills to swim. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. Just it's funny because. Um, sometimes people have given me a hard time for sharing my videos of paddleboarding with with dolphins and whales because mm -hmm. they think all the, and they think all of a sudden there's just going to be like hundreds of people swimming in the ocean and paddleboarding and I'm like and that would be bad like <laughs> it's such a healing beautiful wonderful thing so wow there's so much that you just shared um, you know you. You shared some stuff that happened, like you said, not that long ago in Miami. Well, one story I want to share with you. Recently, I got a brand new uh, stand-up paddleboard. <gasps> and um, I had a very iconic board. I had this really cool Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, Bob Marley board for many years. And when it came time to get a new board, I wanted something. It had to be three things. It had to be beautiful. It had to be fast. And it had to be eco-friendly. So I hired Ryan Harris of Earth Technologies to shape it, and he built me a custom painted, 100% eco-friendly, zero waste, 14 foot mermaid board. What? And Ryan's not, <laughs> yeah, look at my Instagram. Oh my and gosh. Ryan's not only considered a sustainability guru for the incredible work that he does, he's also one of the most progressive surfboard builders in the world, and he's black. And sadly, when I, I went to pick up the board and I shot this video with him and while we were talking, he alerted me of two racial incidents that just occurred. This was all in the last couple of months in Manhattan Beach, California, near you. Mm. Uh, one was a friend, a friend of his being called the N word while just trying to catch some waves. And I just hear this and it's just so sad and so disappointing. I, I don't even know what my question is so much as like. How how is this still happening in, in 2021? I think it's a product of ignorance and people not wanting to change. Um, they have these ideas about people with a little more melanin in their skin than them. And it's it's totally it's totally in their imaginations. We're all, again, human beings having this experience called life. And we just want we just want to be a part of, of living a good life, getting all of our basic needs met, being able to enjoy our families and our friends without being harassed, without being looked as othered, right? As an other person. It's like, we're all the same. There, There's nothing that changes. And it, unfortunately, yeah, people keep perpetuating these same uh, negative tropes and all these other ideas about people who look different than them. And I'm just really sad for the people who choose that 
who choose to be racist, mm -hmm. they're missing out on so much, so many good things, so many wonderful things that individuals like myself and others who are melanated can offer the world. Talents, gifts, all the things. And they're blinded by this, this, uh, this false narrative that's not real. And so my hope is that places like the ocean will be a common ground where we can come together and let all of those things go and wash them away. And so, yeah, it's, it's going to take some time, but we need, we need people who are willing to speak up. So like in the situation with your friend, like if that person was on the lineup, like who spoke up for him, who said something, who addressed the issue in the moment, you have to be brave. You have to have courage and you need to defend your brothers and sisters around you if you truly care. And they did. They actually started a, um, I don't know if it's a nonprofit or an organization around it. They had rallies right there on the sand. So Ryan yeah. and his buddies, like they, they did not hold back. So hopefully things are slowly, you know, evolution, I always say is a slow process, unfortunately, <laughs> but hopefully things are moving in the right direction. It's interesting. You mentioned a little while ago, just the, the power of love, not to sound, um, Actually, I don't care how it sounds because what I've discovered in all these great interviews that I've done in the past few months, and I've talked to people like you that are scientists, I've talked to filmmakers, I've talked to authors, I've talked to people from all different walks of life. And it's really been amazing how at the end of the day, everybody said the same thing. When, when the question is, you know, what really needs to happen for us to, to create um, a better future for the planet, for the animals and for us as humans? And everybody's pretty much said the same thing that not, not that it, it's not love for each other, it's love for ourselves. And the That's idea where it is starts. That, right. If we begin to love ourselves, if I love myself, then guess what? I'm going to love you regardless of how you look and what color you are. I won't <laughs> even see that. So if I love myself, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love my community. I'm going to love everything around me. I'm going to love the planet, the animals. And it really, I, I, I do firmly believe that it, it, you know, we've heard it a million times that all you need is love, but it really, I think it's a factual statement and, and hopefully we're starting to see more of that. Yeah. I think we're really a, a reflection of each other. So if you begin with yourself, if you truly love yourself, if you become at, at peace with who you are, you can then overflow that wealth to others around you. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And we've got so many different things to reckon with, not just, you know, these racial disparities, but also just how we're treating the planet itself, how we're behaving each day. And yeah, it's, it's just right now we're in the midst of this massive moment of, of change. And like I said in the beginning, I am excited about it. I'm still a little bit scared, you know, where we're headed and where we're going to land. But at the same time, it's like, this is the moment for us to create the vision of the world that we want to live in. Totally. And I feel like this, your whole life has kind of prepared you to be a leader in this space, which is, again, it's, it's exciting and it's, <laughs> it could be a burden. It could feel heavy, but um, yeah. you have a lot of love and support around you. How, how would you say racial equality and economic injustice impact ocean and overall planetary conservation? Oh, they go hand in hand. You know, when you look at those who are able to enjoy the ocean, you're seeing a much more affluent um, group of people who have access to discretionary wealth. And that's not the case, especially for people of color in, in the United States. Um, of course, that's not an, uh, a full true statement for all people of color, but like majority of folks are still struggling just to get their basic needs met. Um, and so, yeah, I think... Uh, how do I want to answer that? I mean, the bottom line is that they're both connected and that when we look at planetary health, you know, people who have the time and the space and the capacity to actually care about the health of the planet are people who have their basic needs met. And when you're talking to folks who don't have that luxury, then you're dealing with just survival. And who has time for that when you're trying to feed your children, when you're trying to make sure that rent's paid um, and that you're staying safe just by just being, you know, and, and under the constant threat of um, police violence, it's like, you can't expect someone who's going through that to feel um, willing or able at that point in time to think about anything outside of their experience. And so we, we again, have to get those basic needs covered and then we can continue on with this conversation. But, you know, environmental justice is the same as social justice. It's the same as racial justice. And when we look back at our colo colonial history, right, as well as 
the the practices of white supremacy, unfortunately, is a part of this experience on this planet. We have to look at how we can dismantle those types of systems of oppression and create new ways, new ways of making sure that everyone's included. Yeah, when you say this, I, it reminds me of, I remember hearing years ago about the pirates in Somalia. And these men, mostly were just boys, became pirates only after massive international fishing vessels started fishing illegally in their waters. And they would hold these vessels and their crew for large ransoms. And a large amount of Somali youth saw this as a viable way to support their family. Right. And then right now down in Baja, Mexico, not far from where you and I sit, I just watched the movie um, Sea of Shadows featuring the work of Sea Shepherd. You have fishermen illegally poaching the t t totoaba fish for its swim bladder that they can sell for $5,000 a pop. And then they're resold in China for like $100,000 a fish uh, per bladder. Mm. Mm. And as a result, the vaquita, the world's smallest and now rarest marine animal, has been a victim of collateral damage bycatch, getting caught in gill nets. And now there's only like 10 to 15 vaquita known to exist in the world. Mm. So their, their fate is basically sealed. They're, they're pretty much done. And when I think about why are these people doing what they're doing? Are they quote unquote bad people? Or like you said, are they just hungry people just trying to feed themselves and their families? Yeah. Again, another hallmark, um, I guess, flag that showcases the, the impacts of colonialism and, and white supremacy. We have to be able to say and acknowledge the source of a lot of these issues and then be able to work, you know, re-engineer it or reverse engineer it so that we can create something different. I, I mean, I know I'm, I'm saying the same thing over again, but I, I really, I think I see the parallels. A lot of us see the parallels of these situations when it comes to, you know, even the fishing industry and how things are operating these days. We, we have to look at what's driving this, what's the core driver and, and address it from there. I agree. I always love the line by Buckminster Fuller, where he said, make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. So my question, and maybe it'll maybe be a similar answer and that's fine. How do we create a situation where everyone has the opportunity for the world to work for them while also protecting our home, our planet at the same time. That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the first step is to lean and, and utilize in a respectful way, indigenous wisdom and knowledge because indigenous tribes and human civilizations of our past did a great job of, for the most part, maintaining and, and making sure that their relationship with nature was in harmony. And it's just now within the last few hundred years that our human civilization has forgotten those things. And so now it's a matter of modern society taking a step back, looking at these cultures that have um, passed on knowledge generation to generation, and then infusing that into how we're operating. Um, and it's tough when you're living in a capitalistic society. Capitalism in itself is something that is just, it's just designed to extract and, and to, um, you know, make money. That's it. Like that's, that's really the bottom line. So how do we look at more ideas on a circular economy? What's this cradle to cradle concept? How are we making sure that the people are in, that are involved in this, you know, sale of a product are taken care of? This is, these are questions we have to ask ourselves and, and look at again, the core driver within each individual person. What makes you do what you do? What are you driven by? And then if we start there, we can move forward with, you know, transforming society. I agree. And, and the good news is just as people have made billions and billions of dollars destroying the environment, there's a lot of money to be made in protecting and, re and restoring it also, right? So it's not like, oh, if we do all the right things, nobody's going to make money. It's not going to kill capitalism, right? It could actually enhance it. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not saying that people aren't allowed to make money and to make a living. Like, that's that's not true. That's how our world functions. But it's how can we decide to invest our time, our energy, and our money into things that are actually going to help benefit the planet? And I think that's where a lot of the the excitement within myself comes from because I see the possibilities of 
a circular economy. I see the possibilities of all of the ocean based solutions that are out there, like 3D ocean farming and, um, and, and wind, you know, wind power and like all there, the technology is out there and the science is out there. It's just a matter of the willpower to implement it. Uh, and that's going to take time. It's going to take people making sure that they, they vote for these things to happen. And then also put people in power who are part of our policy making and our political structures that are on board with this idea of putting people and planet um, uh, first and making sure that these decisions being made on a local and national and international level are aligned with these values. So I think it starts with the critical mass. I don't know if we're going to get everybody on board in time, you know, within the timeline that we have right now that our planet is on, um, because it is a very finite timeline for us to get our act together. We've got to really move quickly and we've got to do it uh, in a way that brings people into the conversation without making them feel guilty, making them feel like, you know, this is, this is exclusionary or making, you know, that's, that's a whole other conversation. And that's a part of my work as a science communicator is bringing the information in a way that um, is, re is received, not re rejected right off the bat. That, that is a whole other conversation. <clears throat> and since you brought it up, let, let's go there for a minute. Are you seeing, is it only a percentage of the pop, the populace that is hearing you? And, you know, are you trying to, as a science communicator, are you trying to pull people that don't believe you into your corner? Or, you know, how does that, how does that work? You know what I'm saying? Well, I truly believe first off in, in, you know, being the change that you want to see in the world. So actually doing the things that I talk about or practice the things that I promote, that's, that's where it all begins. And so that's how I choose to communicate with those who might disagree with me. I just live out that experience. But for those who are interested in learning more, just have us, you know, a tiny smidgen of interest in, in getting involved. It's like, what are the most uh, efficient and easy access points that I can pull from? that will bring people into the conversation. I consider it an invitation. Here's how you can get involved. This is this is for you. This aligns with your lifestyle or this is, you know, I'm meeting my audience where they are. Yes. And that to me is the first step in creating productive dialogue between people in general. It's like, how do you understand and empathize with somebody else's experience? You got to start there. You can't just come in and preach and tell all these things because and say what they have to do and demand these actions. That's never going to work. I agree. So a minute ago, you mentioned governments, local and, and nationally, internationally having to step up. I know that you've done a lot of work with Anna and Marcus of Five Gyres Institute, right, on the issues of plastic and our food and in the ocean. Um, yes. Can you tell me, tell me about that? And do you see corporations and governments putting enough weight into alternatives and into the massive cleanup that the planet requires right now? Well, first, I love the work that I've been able to do with Anna and Marcus and Five Gyres Institute. They're a, tr a tremendous organization, proud to be yeah. a part of their advisory board as well. Um, but back in 2019, we went to the Galapagos Islands on a Five Gyres expedition and spent about a week and a half uh, just exploring the Galapagos and staying on a liveaboard and looking at whether or not plastic pollution had made its way to the shorelines of the Galapagos Islands, one of the last wild you know, or semi-wild places on planet Earth? And the answer was yes, a lot of plastic. And we know why due to, you know, ocean currents. This is what happens when it gets pulled from other shorelines. And it was quite disheartening to see that, especially when we found little nurdles in the sand, which are the raw, you know, little spheres of plastic that are sent between factories to produce plastic products. Um, but I will say that their work as an organization and raising awareness about this issue has been um, like just extraordinary what they've been able to do, um, especially from a policy angle and making sure to you know raise awareness in that realm. I think the cleanup efforts going into the future right now, I think we need to focus our energy on, on river output. This is one of the last conversations that I had with Marcus and that he explained how, you know, majority of, of ocean plastic is, is coming out into the ocean through rivers. So how do we, it, it's, it's a, it's a, perfect way for us to be able to access this plastic before it even hits the waves. And that to me is really promising. So we need technology now. We need inventors to come up with uh, mechanisms to collect this plastic uh, in, in our river and stream systems before it gets to the ocean. 
Very good. Um, yeah, their their work's amazing. I met Marcus, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago now at an event up in uh, Long Beach. So, and this kind of ties into what I want to ask you next regarding innovation. Obviously, you seem super dedicated to supporting the youth, uh, just like your family did, your mother for you. And fortunately, it appears we have a whole generation of kids that are committed to solving the problems that we have handed to them. So you were lucky in a way as a six-year-old to kind of figure out your passion. What advice do you give to youth? How do they find their passion and the best tips for them to act upon it? Well, I, I usually tell them it's never too early to start. So whatever you've, you're attracted to, whatever like set your sets your soul on fire, start there. And then look at what you're actually good at. What are these innate skills that you have within yourself, these gifts that come naturally to you? And how can you apply it to that passion? You know, And then from there, taking that passion, taking those skill sets, and then taking it a step further by f figuring out an issue that you care about. What's something that's happening in the world that um, you want to see changed for your future and for those around you? And then how can you put those skill sets and that passion toward that? And it could be one project. It could be building a whole community. It could be anything. It's just don't have, don't be fearful about getting started and use what you have wherever you are. And so that's usually where I, I encourage young people to start. And then from there, it's also like, how can you tap into knowledge of your elders? How do you speak to your mentors that you know? Are you really engaging with them in a way that is beneficial for you and what you want to do with your life? If you, if you have this, this, uh, what would you call it? Like a, a treasure trove, tre treasure trove of knowledge, tap into it. You're living in the digital age. You can connect with somebody in seconds just by sending an email. So why not send the email? The worst I could say is no. <laughs> and I, I host this podcast uh, called The Genius Generation, and it's brought to audiences by Seeker and Trax. And Seeker is like the number one science brand on mobile, and Trax is a podcast network dedicated to tween audiences, which is really great. Mm -hmm. But I get to interview all of these young change makers who have created businesses, made a, a massive discovery or decided to um, create an organization that's directly like solving a specific issue. And now I just say, hey, listen to this podcast, because if you need inspiration, this is where you'll find it. Uh, examples being the first episode is about Ananya Shreeder, who was a young lady at the age of 12 who worked with her chemistry teacher to create a, a test for con contaminated water, kind of like a litmus test for lead. It was a simple test that she could send out to people all over the country and the world to check if their water was contaminated. And she was inspired because of the Flint water crisis. Mm -hmm. And she was over 2000 miles away from Flint, Michigan, but she decided to do something about it. And then you got young women like, um, her name escapes me right now, but her and her brother started an app that was is a service app to help young teens deal with thoughts of suicide. The young lady who started it actually had a, a moment where she was grappling with it and she needed help and she didn't have a way of reaching out to people who she, she knew she could lean on. And so she created this app that with the touch of one button, if they're going through a mental cri like a crisis in that moment, they can hit it and they're five, the five people that are closest to that person can be notified mm. and immediately respond. Wow. So these are the type of things that this next generation, the Gen Zers are coming up with. And it's, it's profound. That is profound. And we'll make sure to share links to your podcast so people can check these incredible interviews out. You also created an initiative called See Youth Rise Up, which I believe was put on hold by COVID last year. Um, what's this program all about? And are you getting ready to fire that back up? Well, I'm the co-creator of See Youth Rise Up, and it was an initiative that we started uh, between myself, Big Blue and You, of course, uh, the Ocean Project, and Youth Ocean Conservation Summit, uh, which was founded by another youth leader named Sean Russell. And the Ocean Project is run by uh, a wonderful man named Bill Mott. And we came together back in like 2015 deciding, okay, what can we, what can we create together? What, what do we need to make? Because we all had youth initiatives within our own nonprofits, but we wanted to figure out what's, what's the next level. And so we decided to create Sea Youth Rise Up as a way to bring together, sorry, it's a really loud car. Okay. We, deci we decided to create you see Youth Rise Up in order to bring together youth leaders in the ocean conservation space who wanted to get involved with uh, speaking to policymakers on Capitol Hill and talking to them about ocean policy. 
And so back in 2016, we kicked off this, this week long, uh, event. It felt more like a, a field trip because we had, uh, seven young people, both in high school and in college meeting for the first time, but bonding over this, you know, um, collective passion, which was about the ocean and, you know, gallivanting around DC, heading to Capitol Hill and going into these meetings for the first time with senators and representatives and their staffers. It was life changing to watch uh, these young people take part in this program. It was also a part of uh, Capitol Hill Oceans Week. So they got to go to events there. Um, the last time we had Sea Youth Rise Up was 20. Oh my gosh, was it 2018? It was 2019. Yes, I'm getting my dates all mixed up now, but we were a part of a uh, long year. <laughs> we were a part of uh, the March on Washington for the ocean, the, the ocean march. So, yeah, it was it's been a great journey and I can't wait till we can get started again because there's nothing like having um, like minds joined together from all walks of life and then work together on, on a on a mission and then also go to these meetings, which for most Americans, I would safely say that uh, many of us don't realize that we can actually, I mean, now it's going to be a little different since the beginning of 2021. But previous to this, we were able to walk into Capitol Hill, meet with our policymakers and talk to them about what we care about as citizens. And I think that most Americans didn't recognize this this opportunity. So it was really, it felt really good to be able to create that that space for them to do that. Mm. And all of the young people who have been a part of Sea Youth Rise Up are now either um, leading their own organization or they're playing a significant role in another org, but still sticking with the same mission and focus. That's amazing. And are you hoping to fire that back up later this year or? What's yeah, happen? I hope we, I hope we'll get to, to do another round. Um, we still have to, of course, look for funding and, you know, and logistics are tough with COVID. So if it's not in person this year, uh, hopefully we can have some type of digital gathering. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm hoping by 2022, we can, we can jumpstart that back up again in person. You've done a lot, Danny. I'm I'm very impressed. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, there's no 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 team no sleep over here. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Now I'm getting no, sleep. Yeah. Thanks to God. Now you're getting sleep. <laughs> you're, you're caught up now. And you're ready to get back yeah. out there. So you I also guess. hosted. I believe it was two seasons of uh, Nature Knows Best, which was on Fox, Hulu, and Amazon. And this was a show based on biomimicry and how to create a sustainable future by emulating nature. First question on that, how did that little six-year-old pirate mermaid want to be marine biologist wind up getting her own TV show? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was inspired by Bill Nye the Science Guy as a child. Growing up every day, I'd watch his show after school religiously. Um, I really enjoyed the way that he uh, just enthusiastically explained science in a way that made it fun. And he was so passionate. And to this day, I mean, he's doing similar work and he is an icon in our, you know, in our American society because of the way that he did that. And that was for the most part, a lot of, you know, young children's first introduction to science. Um, so when I left college and I started making those videos with untamed science, there was an opportunity that came up a few years later down the road in 2016 after I had posted some random YouTube videos of myself like scuba diving and doing all kinds of other adventures. Uh, a young uh, TV development you know, producer found that video and then reached out. And that's when uh, we created the, the opportunity to start Nature Knows Best. And so again, YouTube came and worked in my favor and just being willing to put myself out there and to share some content, even though I had no idea who would actually see it or receive it. Um, it was really comforting to know that, wow, like, okay, this has, there's something to this, right? Um, but by, by the time we released the first season in 2016, that was the first time we'd, we'd really seen on national television at that level, uh, a woman of color hosting a show about science, which is crazy to think about, right? You like 2016 took that long. <laughs> Meanwhile, overseas across the other side of the pond in the UK, there have been plenty of women, uh, women of color who have, you know, been a part of hosting and producing, uh, natural history content, but it was such a great experience and truly a dream come true because I got to meet with scientists, engineers, uh, inventors and entrepreneurs who were all creating these brand new cutting edge technologies and designs that were all emulating nature. And to me that, again, that's an, besides 
looking to youth for, for energy, I also look toward nature and I look toward biomimicry as a source of that, because that's truly where I think most of our solutions are. So I want to talk a little bit more about what biomimicry is and why it's important, but I want to back up for a second because I think you said something so important about you just put yourself out there <laughs> and people <laughs> saw it and say what you will about social media, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it gives anyone in the world basically who has internet access a platform. And so to me, that's a very motivational thought that you shared for anyone that might be watching who feels that they can make a difference. It just takes a little bit of courage, right? I interviewed uh, Captain Paul Watson last week, and, and he talked about his his three main values and one being courage. You got to have the courage to put yourself out there. And I just think I just want to acknowledge you for that. I just think you're a shining example of someone who had the courage to put themselves out there, not for your own. I mean, I don't hear... I don't hear a shred of ego in you, Danny. I just hear. Oh, thank you. I hear someone who's confident and loves herself, which is not ego. That's a beautiful thing. And more importantly, cares about the planet, the ocean, the animals, the, the two leggeds, everybody. So I just want to acknowledge <laughs> you. Before I ask you more about biomimicry, I just felt that that was important. So um, through this podcast, I've got to interview some incredible people like Louis Schwartzberg, who made uh, fantastic fungi which talks about <laughs> mycelium and mushrooms and emulating nature and uh, Cyril from Parlay for the Oceans, who's designing things uh, based on nature. So for anyone that doesn't know what is biomimicry and how can we use it to create a more sustainable future by emulating nature? Well, uh, yeah, biomimicry is an exciting discipline of science, but it's interdisciplinary. So we're seeing all forms of, of science being involved um, and yeah, it, it starts with, again, just taking notes of how things work out in nature already. And many of the inventions and things that we featured on Nature Knows Best um, were simple, simple designs. Everything from Velcro, emulating a certain type of plant seed that sticks to fur, um, all the way to helicopters, which emulate dragonflies. And I think one of the most exciting episodes that we had, or at least my own personal favorite, was looking at um, shark skin and dermal denticles and how that technology can be applied to different surfaces to prevent bacterial growth and proliferation. So using that, that same shape on a surface that dermal denticles have on a shark, you know, on their skin, um, it's kind of like a, it's a shield and you never really see sharks covered in algae. You don't see them. Sometimes you'll see parasites and whatnot, but and remoras, but rarely ever do you see things growing on their skin. And that's for a reason. And so you can apply this technology to the inside of hospital tubes that are, you know, connected to an IV, or you can put it on hospital surfaces to prevent bacterial growth there. But you can also apply it to the hull of a boat to prevent barnacles and other things from growing on a boat. And so that was really one of my favorite episodes. And then the other one was uh, about the Bullet Center in Seattle, Washington, which is a class A six story building that is proof of concept of how we can build buildings better in the future. And the entire building from <laughs> the roots, which went all the way down to some geothermal um, heat sources from below the, the surface of the ground, all the way up to the roof that were covered in solar panels and rainwater capture systems. This whole building represented a tree, a Douglas fir tree to be exact, which is a native species that grows in the Pacific Northwest. And not only did it provide its own energy for the entire building, but it also provided energy to the surrounding buildings on the grid, which was incredible. So those... That entire show, there were two seasons of it, 26 episodes. I learned something new every time I watch it, and I watched it like over and over again. I, <laughs> I actually saw, I watched that video. We'll share a link to that about the tree. That was, that was super cool. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Is that the show's no longer? Yeah, unfortunately, they, they decided to go a different direction uh, because we had covered a lot of really great things here in the U.S. And I think the next round of episodes would have required us to go internationally, mm -hmm. um, international. So that's where it ended. But, you know, it, TV production and Hollywood, quote unquote, is is a, is a very fickle industry and things change on a dime. And that's one of the things that, you know, as a person in front of the camera, you have to deal with. Uh, I've gone through so many different no's, rejections, 
not right nows from different companies. And it's just a matter of having a certain level of tenacity and, and not being willing to give up. And so that's really served me very well in my life. Um, not to say that it isn't hard. Of course it's been hard and, um, requires a lot of like, just, <laughs> you got to hype yourself up. You got to really, you know, be willing to just continue to take that leap of faith time and time again. And, and, so far I've landed on my feet, which I'm really grateful for, mm. but, um, but there's so much more to do and I can't wait to continue to tell more stories uh, on whatever platform that might be, whether it's YouTube or Apple TV or Netflix or back on traditional network TV. Or my podcast, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> podcast included too. Yes, absolutely. No, you're, you're, you're very inspiring. Um, and I think that attitude of, keep moving forward, keep moving forward, even when you get knocked down. And I think it can be challenging, right? I, I, for me, I always say that our greatest strength is also our greatest weakness. And for me, it's being sensitive. Like I just, I feel so much and I, I feel for the plight of the planet and the animals and the humans and, and it's hard. So I, I would imagine you have this, this quote unquote weakness also like to do the work that you do to care that much you obviously have empathy and 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 you feel and which can make it a little harder sometimes to kind of pick yourself up when you get knocked down right yeah it's definitely challenging um but i lean on the clarity of my mission and the mission is to connect human beings with the ocean and provide those portals for people to to fall in love with the planet that we're living on like I'm all about space exploration. I love the concept of building civilization on another planet, but at the same time, I really love earth. I want to be here. I, I love this planet too much. And there's still so much worth protecting and, and nature will take care of itself if we just give it the time and space. And the issue is that human beings haven't given it the time and space with the exception of 2020 when we were on lockdown and we saw the immediate results of us just slowing down and stopping for just a few months, we saw a huge difference. And so imagine if we could have the collective willpower to say, hey, let's give nature this opportunity to restore um, and do everything in our power, you know, to, with our own behaviors to help it along the way. But at the end, Earth will be here. Planet Earth will be here with or without us. We're yeah. just now in this window of time to choose. Do we want to stay here? Do we want to be here? Well said. And this, this kind of brings us full circle to our opening conversation, my fear now is that as life appears to be taking on some resemblance of normal, that we're just going to turn the motor back on and and crank it up even stronger than ever before, more than erasing all the gains that occurred during this great pause. Um, so my question is, what lessons do you really hope that we've learned as a species? And most importantly, what's it going to take as a human community to create a future in which 8 billion of us can actually live in harmony and balance with the planet. <sighs> oh man. There's really no single answer to that beyond getting in touch first with who you are and what your values are as an individual. What do you really care about? Um, and then from there we need, we just need more compassion in the world. I really think that's the true north, the true answer that we can lean on. Compassion will bring us to a place where we can see each other um, as equals. We can empathize with each other's experiences. And then if we have that type of compassion within ourselves and we share it with those around us, we can also share that with nature. And I think that's where it starts. Compassion and love. I think it starts and ends there. So now the most important question of this entire interview, Danny, when can I coerce you down to Laguna Beach to go paddleboarding with the dolphins and whales with me? <laughs> Listen, I don't need any type of coercing. I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. Seriously. Um, fun you fact. Think I'm I, kidding, I, by the way, I'm not. I'm not kidding at no, all. No, I'm not kidding either. <laughs> I, uh, I'm currently carless here. I, I rely on um, rental cars when I need them. It's a choice right now just because I don't have a lot of places to drive and I'm saving on my carbon footprint for the time being, which is great. Um, so I will definitely make my way down there. We'll, we'll, we'll coordinate, we'll figure out a time date let's and let's do it. Do it. I, would, I, I haven't would... been paddle boarding out there in so long. Oh no. Oh, well, I'm going to show you 
um, my whole world here in Laguna, which is lots of dolphins and we still have uh, gray whales migrating through right now. So Danny, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I just, for me, it, it's so beautiful to interview a scientist. And when I ask, you know, what's the number one thing that needs to occur? Your answer is not, oh, we need this technology or that technology. Not that, not that technology is not important, not that policy change is not important, but just to hear you talk about compassion for ourselves, for each other, that that is really what we need more of. That that just, it feels really good. So thank you for that. Um, last couple of things, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and to support your work? Uh, yeah. Um, you can find me on my website at dannywashington.com. Uh, also, bigblueandyou.org is uh, my nonprofit's website. And I'm on all social media platforms. So hit me up on the inter internet. Uh, I definitely <laughs> welcome DMs and, and messages whenever um, people want to send them. So yeah, it's great to connect with you, Rich. And thank you for these extremely thoughtful wow. questions that you presented. And, and I wanted to also thank you for the acknowledgement you know, it's, it's when you're moving really fast and you're working nonstop, it's hard to sometimes reflect and just say thanks for like getting to where you are and where you, where you're headed. Mm. Yeah. I just appreciate that. So thank you. You got it. Well, I, I totally get it. Like we just keep going, we keep going and it, we don't take the time to stop and, um, reflect and be grateful. And, and I just wanted you to feel seen for who you are and the work that you are doing in the world. And we got to get on the water soon. So Danny Washington, you are amazing. We'll, like I said, we'll share links of everything that you are working on and for ways that people can support you and follow you. Thank you so much for your heart, for your soul, for your love. Thanks for who you are. And, um, Really appreciate you being here today. That is our show, everybody. We will see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Danny. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. <laughs>